All right, it's 7.01, so we can get started. Welcome, everyone, to our special class entitled The Eternal and the Unsinkable. How's that for a title? That was Harvard Davidowitz's brilliant idea. I can't think of that kind of stuff. I'm not that creative. The Eternal and the Unsinkable, a class about the Jewish connections uh, to, the, to the Titanic. So thank you all for joining. Um, please make yourselves comfortable if uh, when our class is done or if you're, anyone wants to grab a bite to eat, we've got some refreshments over here. And um, after everyone, after the class is done, I really encourage everyone, we have over here on display, um, someone here in town who uh, collects interesting artifacts and things and the like, has uh, a, uh, an amazing display of original Titanic artifacts, you will, you I guess. Um, here we have a, uh, it's a poster, you know, advertising the, the Titanic. Two newspaper clippings from the days immediately after, after the Titanic. Um, there's a signed photograph by, I believe it was the youngest survivor of the Titanic, as well as the original um, written article, uh, written testimony, I guess, of a, of a survivor. So it's really remarkable to, to read. And uh, I, I just, I reread it again after, I read it originally a while ago, and then I prepared for this class and I studied a lot about the Titanic and uh, it took on a whole new meaning, like when you actually are, understand what's going on. So when we're finished with today's class, I certainly encourage everyone, feel free to stick around. I'll answer any questions, grab a bite to eat, and certainly uh, look at some of the stuff. It's, it's really amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. In 1945, the German steamer Wilhelm Gustloff, some boat, um, it's during World War II in January of 45, it was torpedoed by a Soviet Navy submarine, and the estimated loss of life was 9,400 people. Most believe it was the greatest maritime disaster ever. In 1987, not very long, long, long ago in December, the Doña Paz from Manila to Taglopan, I don't know where that is, um, it crashed, it collided with a cargo vessel, and 4,386 people were killed. That's considered the largest non-war-related maritime disaster. And then, famously, you may or may not remember, if you recall your American history or your world history for that matter, in 1915, almost 12,000 people were killed when the Lusitania was torpedoed by, by the Germans. Almost 1,200 people were killed in that attack, and it triggered World War I functionally. And the question that has to be asked is, I've never heard of that first disaster, the Wilhelm Gustav, with almost 10,000 people killed. I never heard of the Doña Paz. That was in my lifetime. More than 4,000 people killed. I'm familiar with the Lusitania, but that's because I like studying American history. You ask most people, what was the Lusitania? I don't know if everyone in this room has heard of the Lusitania, but many people have not. Lusitania's triggered World War I. These three disasters, these three catastrophes have significant, either significantly more loss of life than the Titanic or resulted in the case of the Lusitania with far significant, more significant historical ramifications. Yet, when I think, when I tell you, think of a uh, shipwreck, think of the most tragic boat to ever go down, what do we all think of? The Titanic. Everyone thinks of the Titanic. And it's a fascinating question, something that not the first person to ask, but many have asked, why are we so fascinated by the Titanic? Why are we putting together, you know, any winning movies 80 years after the boat went down? Why does it capture our fascination, our curiosity? What is it about the Titanic? Now, there are many theories, many answers, and I am assuming, I believe the answer is that it's a confluence of things. There are many things. It was this maiden voyage. It was this luxury liner, a lot of things. But I want to share a passage, it's a story in, in the Talmud, that the Talmud mentions, that has always resonated with me, and I think it really helps capture why the Titanic is so such a fascination why we are so captured by the terrible tragedy that was the sinking of the Titanic. 
Talmud tells us an amazing story. If you recall, we all know the story. The Jews are enslaved in Egypt. We know that great story, the story of Passover and the Exodus. But the Talmud tells us, referenced more clearly in the Medrash, but the Talmud also discusses how when the Pharaoh, the Jews are living in Egypt, the Pharaoh initially wasn't so sure he wanted to enslave the Jews. He was considering it, weighing his different options. And he brought in his different counselors to get their opinions. Do you think it's a good idea? Should we enslave the Jews? And the Talmud tells us there were three counselors, three advisors that the Pharaoh had. One of them, his name was Yisro. And Yisro said, this is a terrible idea. How can you go ahead and enslave the Jews? It's cruel, it's unjust, it's immoral, it's inappropriate. He said, no. There was another person, another advisor. His name was Eo, Joe. And he was like, I, I don't know, I abstain. And then there was a third character. His name was Bilam. And he said, enslave the Jews. It's a great idea, Pharaoh. We all know the end of the story. The Pharaoh listens to Bilam's advice. And we know the end of the, we know the Exodus story. Talmud says there's a part two to this story. It's remarkable. Talmud says that one day, years later, Talmud says as consequence for their actions, the Talmud said, Eo, who was kind of neutral. So he had to deal, we know the story of Job. He had to deal with affliction, a lot of difficulty in his life. Yisro, who protested, he ends up becoming the father-in-law of Moses. And his grandchildren, the Talmud say, as a reward for him going in and protesting against the Pharaoh and standing up for that which is right, his children ended up sitting on the Lishkas Hagazis. They ended up being the judges of the Jewish people. But Billah, who went ahead and he said, enslave the Jews, he was punished and he dies a horrible death. But before he dies, Talmud says that Bilam bumps into Yisro and he sees Yisro and his children, Moses, and he says, Bilam, Bilam says to Yisro, says, Yisro, I don't get it. Both you and me, we were both at that council. We were both at that meeting. We were both, you know, advisors to the Pharaoh. And now look at us. 40 years later, and our lives are so diametrically opposed. You know, you've got kids who are leaders of the Jewish people, and I'm this evil villain, Billa. You know, how could that be? Thomas says he's like metame. He's in wonderment. He's astonished. How could this be? I remember my rabbi always asked, what do you mean, how could this be? You said yes. He said no. What's your big question? My rabbi explained what's going on over here. The reason why Bilam was astonished, he didn't have a question that he couldn't figure out. It was a rhetorical question. What Bilam was observing was that how his life and Yisro's life up to that fateful moment were identical. They were both counselors to the Pharaoh. And you know, we all live our lives and we have the daily grind of our lives. And, you know, every day we try to grow a little bit and every day we try to become a little bit better and something we talk about here in terms of our personal growth and growth on any level, you know, step by step. And Bill, I'm saying you and me, we were both the same guy. And then one decision, one day, you said no, I said yes, and our lives completely diverged. And he was astonished in the sense that, you know, most of the days of our lives don't stand out. They don't go ahead and a choice that I make today or make tomorrow, probably not going to alter the course of world history. But every now and again, maybe a dozen times in our lives, we're going to hit a moment that absolutely defines our life. You make a choice, something happens, you encounter someone, and your life takes a drastic shift in trajectory. The sinking of the Titanic, in my belief, was one of those points. It's one of those moments. It wasn't just a tragedy. There have been many, many tragedies throughout the ages. The Titanic was significantly more than that. You see, the Titanic came at the end of the Victorian era, at the end of the Gilded Age, if you study your American history, at the end of the Industrial Revolution, the great technological revolution of the late 1800s. The world technologically had boomed. Electricity, steam, automobile, airplanes. The world technologically had just exploded. The Titanic disaster was the first disaster, man-made technological disaster of the 20th century. And it was the first technological disaster really as a result of the technology of the Industrial Revolution. 
up until that point, the psyche of the world, at least the United States and Great Britain, but by extension, really the whole world, the mindset, the, the, the psyche of the collective world was that technology is great. Technology is going to only do good for us. Technology is going to advance mankind. And then the Titanic sank. And that bubble was burst. And it represented a crash and a sinking, not just of a boat, but of an ideal of how people looked at the world and how people understood the role of technology, the role of the Industrial Revolution. I believe that's why the, the sinking of the Titanic, the, which was a terrible tragedy, marks a tremendous shift in technology um, and what can go wrong. Today's class, we're going to try to co cover some of the Jewish connections, the historical backgrounds, maybe some of the Torah lessons and ideas that I think emerge from the story of the Titanic. Where do I get my, where do I get my information from? Google, no, there is the, although it's very helpful, the best, but the, well, not the best. The first book, the first great book written on the topic was Walter Lord's A Night to Remember. It was turned into a movie. It was in, 19, in the 1950s. It was the earliest real good research and real good work. And it's considered uh, it's considered the classic. Um, the next book, if, if you're going to read one book on the Titanic, the book that I would recommend is a book. It's called End of a Dream. They he updated it. Now it's just called The Titanic. It's by Win Craig, Win Craig Wade. It's an absolutely amazing book. It's riveting. He couldn't put it down. I'll tell you one thing that I didn't read or didn't see. I'm the last guy in the world to have never seen the movie. Anyone here not see the movie? How can I get up here and talk about the history of the Titanic if I never saw, never heard the, the music? It's all right. From what I understand, though, from the little research that I did on specifically on the film, is a lot of what they did was historically accurate, but obviously they wanted to make it into a drama. So the overall plot, I think there's a lady falls in love and the diamond, none of that, I, from what I understand, is true. And there's going to be one major thing that I'm going to pick on time permitting later in the in the in our class where I think they are historically inaccurate. Finally, there's another book that was hard to get my hand on, um, but we were able to pull it off. It's called The Jews of the Titanic. This was written by someone in Israel. This is it's it's a, not the easiest book to read because it was originally written in Hebrew. It was a student from Jerusalem and this is a translation of it. So the translation is is kind of choppy, but it's definitely informative if those who want um, more information. The story behind the Titanic really begins in 1907. A boat, which we described earlier, the Lusitania, part of the, the Cunard Lines, in 1907, it, it was called, it's called the Blue Ribbon Award, which is the fastest boat to get across the Atlantic. And in 1907, the Lusitania, set in, on its maiden voyage, it's able to cross the Atlantic in four days, 19 hours, 53 minutes, averaging almost 26 knots. That was just shat, that was just changed the world. Think about Christopher Columbus sailing across the Atlantic and it took months, right? Now four days, not even five days. It was amazing. There was a competing boat line called the White Star Line, White Star Line, which was trying to keep up with the Lusitania. And it was, its CEO was a person named Bruce Ismay. And he ended up basically, what they decided is that they couldn't compete with the Lusitania for speed. White Star Line ended up getting bought out by a company, a conglomerate headed by uh, J.P. Morgan, James Pierpont Morgan. And they decided what they're gonna do is they're not gonna try to build a boat that's faster than the Lusitania. They'll build a boot, a boat that's more luxurious than the Lusitania. And they had this grand idea they're gonna build using a boat uh, shipbuilders called Harland and Wolf in Ireland. They're gonna go ahead and build two boats. They're really gonna be three boats, but they're gonna start by building two together. One will be called the Olympic. The other will be called, thank you. Who was Harland and Wolf, the shipbuilders? So I don't know who Harland is, but I'll tell you Wolf, who was Mr. Wolf? His name was Gustav Wilhelm Wolf, born in 1834 in Hamburg. His parents had recently converted to Christianity. He was, he was Jewish. The story of our tragedy begins. The boat was built by Harland and Wolf. Mr. Wolf was Jewish, although he converted to, to Christianity. 
They build the boat and they all, uh, the Olympic goes ahead and it's made in voyages in June of 1911. Now, theoretically, story is supposed to go is that the Titanic is its sister ship. It's not really true. Theoretically, they were built side by side. They're amazing pictures of them side by side in their dry docks. It's absolutely amazing. However, the Olympic was sort of like the test run. And after the Olympic set sail, the Ismay and the various people up on the, on the head of, of White Star Line, they wanted to make the Titanic even greater. So they kind of used the Olympic and they saw what they didn't like about it and they made alterations and changes on the Titanic. The Titanic was grand. It was 882 feet, nine inches long with a maximum breadth of 92 feet and six inches. Had nine decks. I read somewhere that it had 10 decks, but I think it's a mistake. It had nine decks. And I want to read you a description of what the Titanic was like. This is from Win Craig, Win Craig Wade's book. In newspapers on both sides of the Atlantic, she was soon called the wonder ship, the last word in luxury, the unsinkable ship, the biggest ship in the world. On Wall Street, she was nicknamed the millionaire special. In March, a great deal of overtime was worked by Harland and Wolf in order to have the Titanic ready for April. Following her sea trials, the Titanic loomed in Southampton Harbor. It's in Northern Ireland and on April 3rd, 1912. Um, according to one spectator, when it was first released into the water, uh, one spectator said it was like the side of a cliff. Her breathtaking enormity dominated the all first impressions. She was nearly 900 feet long. The American journal power, um, the American, an American journal advised its readers to run one sixth of a mile, go run one sixth of a mile to appreciate in a small way, the vastness of the ship from top to bottom, her nine steel decks made her equivalent in height to an 11 story building, a top per, a top her spangling superstructure, four gigantic funnels, one, two, three, four. That was, it was a very identifiable boat. It had those four funnels. I don't think any of the other boats had four funnels. Don't believe, I think the Lusitania, oh, maybe Lusitania had four, I don't know. A total of 3 million rivets had gone into her gleaming hull. Her three huge anchors represented a combined weight of 31 tons. Her 101 ton rudder, which had to be cast in six separate pieces was, okay, was the height of a, it was basically the size of a house. It was enormous. It was beautiful. It was grand. It was luxurious. You have to remember sailing across the Atlantic was terrifying. Some, some famous guy who said crossing the Atlantic is like going to prison with a chance of drowning. It was terrifying. People didn't like crossing the Atlantic. And these boats used to heave and ho. And they, the bigger they were, the more stable they were. But it was terrifying. These people like the Cunard and also the White Star Line, their idea was make it as comfortable and as luxurious as possible. People will forget that you're really taking your life into your hands by trying to cross the Atlantic on a boat. In the bowels of her ship was an awesome power plant capable of moving 46,000 ton vessel, the 46,000 ton vessel through the water with a combined strength of over 50,000 horses. Remember when I read that? I don't know why that struck me. 50,000 horses. I don't know how many horsepower my car is, but that's pretty impressive. Um, it was enormous. The power plant was sectioned. Okay, now here's an important thing. What's going to be obviously a significant part of our story is are the safety features of the Titanic. The power plant was sectioned. The power plant is it was, the way these things were operated. They were steam. They were steam boilers, and you had firemen and coal men um, on board the boat. That would be. Can you imagine this job? Your job was to literally shovel coal into furnaces for five straight days. And these furnaces were very big and very powerful. And the furnaces would basically boil water. The water would create steam. The steam would go ahead and move a turbine. The turbine would go ahead and move gears and cranks and shafts and move the, the, the three propellers in the back of the boat. Someone had to be shipping. Now it's interesting is it needed, I think we're gonna see over, I think over 600 tons of coal a day to move this thing. The power plant was the heart of the boat. It was sectioned to a thoughtful arrangement of 16 watertight compartments divided by 15 traverse steel bulkheads. Advertisements assured that any two main compartments may be flooded without any way involving the safety of the ship. In the unlikely event of an emergency, watertight doors would clutch down like sluggish guillotine blades, sealing the portals of every compartment. These doors could be operated all at once electronically from the bridge or individually, listen to this, either uh, by the action of a crewman 
Or what happened was is there was also these weights. If water filled up in the boat, the weight of the water would automatically lower these bulkhead doors to seal off the water. This thing had technological marvels. Now, the whole notion of it being an unsinkable boat, everyone did call it unsinkable. It should be noted. The shipbuilders did not advertise it as such. That was the popular perception. Everyone knew it really did have the state-of-the-art, the latest um, in technology. It leaves Southampton on Wednesday, the 10th of April, 1912. It would, make, it would make two stops, one in Cherbourg and then one in Queenstown, and then it continued on its line, continued on its way. Wednesday, April 12th, 1912, for those of you who are keeping score at home, was also the 23rd of the Jewish month of Nisan. That is a very important thing for two reasons. Two reasons. Number one, the 23rd of Nisan also is Isruchad Pesach. It's the day, the first day after Passover, which means if you were Jewish and you wanted to cross the Atlantic and you didn't want to travel on Passover, the first boat to leave was the Titanic. But there was a second reason why the 23rd of Nisan is very important for our story. And that is, for those who are unfamiliar, the way the Jewish month works, you ever know, like, when's Hanukkah this year? You know, Hanukkah never is, it always, always moving. Why is that, right? Hanukkah, it's early, it's late, it's Christmas, it's Thanksgiving, it's in the middle of January. Why, why do the Jewish holidays always shift? So if you're familiar, the way the Jewish calendar works, it's a lunar solar calendar. Basically, the Jewish calendar follows, on a monthly cycle, the system of the moon. So every new moon is the first day of the Jewish month. The 23rd day is towards the end of the month. Now, the reason why the day is always, always the, the problem is, is that if you add up 12 lunar months, you're going to get 354 and a half days a year. So we have to add every couple of years, we add in a leap month to balance it out. And that's why the holidays are always shifting. The 23rd of the Jewish month of Nisan means what's the moon going to be looking like? It's going to be getting smaller. And if you happen to be in the middle of the Atlantic, on April 14th at 11.50 p.m., it's going to be, do the math, the 27th of the month, which means you're going to have hardly any moonlight. It means it's going to be very, very dark. And we're going to see that's, that's a tremendously important thing. There were definitely Jews aboard the, the Titanic. We know that for sure. Who were they and how many were they? The challenge of answering that question, how many Jews, who were the Jews on the Titanic? How are you going to find that out? How are you going to know if someone's Jewish? I got a great idea. Ask them. That's going to be a big problem. 1,500 of them, did, of, the people, of the passengers on the, on the Titanic, never made it off. So you have to figure out from the people who survived, the 712 survivors, those people were easily easier to figure out what were their identity, who were they. We know a lot more about the 712 survivors. The 1,500 that didn't, it's very hard to figure out who were they because... The Titanic was, the, the passengers or the people on the Titanic can be divided into four groups. There's first class, second class, third class, also called steerage, as well as the crew. Okay, the crew we know a lot about. The first class was the wealthiest of the wealthy, not just of Jews, but of the whole world. They were huge, and there were many, many Jews that when we know everyone who was on the first class, we know who they were. And included in the first class, which was, again, the, the description of what these, what these um, staterooms look like are just magnificent. But there were some significant people on board. Famously, not Jewish, one of the most significant people, you know, in terms of history, was John Jacob Astor, who was worth just a gazillion dollars back then. He was worth $150 million back then. Back then, $150 million can actually buy you a lot of things. Nowadays, what it gets like three cans of Coke. But <laughs> he wasn't Jewish, obviously. But there were some tremendously influential and significant Jews that were on board in the first class. And we know who they were. The wealthiest Jew, not that we go care about wealth, but just who was a very significant person, was Benjamin Guggenheim of the Guggenheim. He inherited a lot of money from his parents, ran several companies, and was for sure the wealthiest Jew on the, on the Titanic. Another very influential couple, a very significant Jewish couple that was on, but now oh, just as Guggenheim was married, his wife wasn't Jewish, from what, if I recall, nor was she on the boat. He didn't have a very good marriage. His mistress was on the boat. 
Okay. Isidore Strauss and his wife, Ida, were also on the boat. Isidore was born in Bavaria. He moved to Georgia when he was 10 years old. This is, and he was Jewish. This is the part that we don't really love so much. He lived in Georgia. He was a slave owner, fought for the Confederacy. He enrolled in the Confederacy, but he was too young to serve. So he ended up being a blockade runner. It's amazing. If you recall, the, 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 um, the North put a blockade around the South, which means they couldn't get stuff in and out of the Confederacy. So they had these blockade runners, which would mean you'd, you'd be on these fast boats to try to outrun the blockade. So he worked on the blockade runner. After the war, the Strauss family, really his parents and his, his I believe, four brothers, they moved to New York. And in New York City, they were very successful. They opened up a business where they would sell like, like housewares, like pots and pans. And they opened up, opened this, this pot and pan store. Uh, they opened it in the basement of a retailer named Rollin Hussey Macy. At some point, the Strauss, they would merge with and you know, kind of become partners with Rollin Hussey Macy. And eventually they would just buy him out and they renamed their store Macy's. The Strauss's Isidore Strauss was a part owner of Macy's department store. He became very wealthy. His brother, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. His brother was, a, was named Nathan Strauss. Nathan Strauss is a very significant person in Jewish history. Who is Nathan? Well, just, just to follow, Isidore Strauss, by the way, ends up becoming a, a congressman for, for like two year one term congressman. But it's an amazing story about Nathan Strauss. Who is Nathan Strauss? You were just in Israel. Did you make it to Rehov, uh, Rehov Strauss in Jerusalem? Anyone remember Rehov Strauss, middle of the city? You guys need to hang out in Jerusalem more. Anyone ever hear Rehov Strauss? Rehov Nathan Strauss. It's named after him. Why? Nathan Strauss was a philanthropic Zionist. And he was in Jerusalem at the time. He was in Israel um, in 1912. And his plan was to go back to the United States with his brother, Isidore, on the Titanic. But he broke his leg when he was in Israel and he had to stay back. Didn't make it on the Titanic. Anyone ever make it to Netanya in Israel? Yeah. Yeah. Netanya, beautiful town on the coast, right? What's Netanya named after? Nathan yeah. Strauss. He was a significant person. Nathan didn't get on the, on the Titanic. He was supposed to, but his brother Isidore definitely did. And you had some wealthy second class. The second class compartment of the Titanic was as beautiful as most boats first class. And then you had the third class. If you speak to most people and you think, what was the Titanic? It was a luxury liner. Who, was, who are the people on the, on the Titanic? Wealthy people, right? That was the impression that I always had. Turns out more than 50% of the people on the Titanic were good old fashioned, poor, regular folk. Most of those people were immigrants or just regular people from actually 30 different countries. And they were in the third class called steerage. It happened to be back in those days, if you were in steerage, steerage was literally that. It's where you put the steer, the cows. Oftentimes, it wouldn't be till the late 1800s where there was regulation, you would oftentimes have boats that one way they would take people in steerage on the way back, take the steers. It was disgusting. And the Titanic was beautiful. The Titanic steerage in third class was, it was great. And on board, there were people, as I mentioned, from 30 different countries. And we, but the problem is we don't know who those people are. We don't know who those people are. As we're going to see mo the overwhelming majority of the people in the third class did not survive. And we just don't know who they are. So while we know for a fact, for sure, that there were roughly 70, 70 let's say we know of it, about 75 Jews that were definitely on the, on the Titanic. Most of those are either people who survived or were in first class or second class. The problem is, is the people who died in third class, we just don't know. One of the survivors who was in third class, I think there were only like two, I think Jewish male survivors from third class. He claimed in an interview that there were about 40 Jewish, uh, 40 Jews on board in third class in, in steerage. Uh, an a article in, in a Jewish newspaper published two months after the sinking claim there were 71. Others have theorized there was over 100. We will never know the answer to that question. We just don't know. We don't know who these people were because they're all sadly in the bottom of the Atlantic. What did these Jews do when they were on the boat? More importantly, for a rabbi, I'm curious, what did they eat? If you were kosher observant and you wanted to go ahead and cross the Atlantic, 
before the Titanic, what did you do? You ate a lot of really bad stuff because you couldn't eat from the kitchens on these boats. So you basically drank a lot of water and I don't know, keep packed like the modern day equivalent of cans of tuna fish. You had to eat, you know, dried figs, things that would survive, you know, on your own. The Titanic, we are very sure, although we don't have hard, hard, hard evidence, but we're very, very sure there was a kosher kitchen on board. There was a kosher kitchen on board. How do we know that? We know that from a couple of reasons. Number one, the Olympic, remember, the Olympic is its sister ship. The Olympic had a kosher kitchen. We have, a, we have one surviving picture of the kosher kitchen. There's a lot of evidence. They definitely were planning on kosher food there. And there was definitely a lot of evidence that there was going to be kosher food. There are invoices from the local uh, Southampton kosher butcher of deliveries to the Titanic. As well, it's nearly impossible to get your hands on this. You'll go onto eBay and you'll see that you can buy this. It's not true. You can, there are, on muse, in a couple of museums here and there, there are, um, there's cutlery, there are dishes from the Olympic that are clearly marked as kosher. The dishes say kosher on it and they say dairy and meat. These dishes were definitely on the Olympic. There is no record of similar dishes being on the Titanic, but most people theorize that it was. Now, it's a remarkable thing is that there was the cook. The cook was someone named Charles Kennel. We don't know if he was Jewish. This fellow, Eli Moskowitz, argues he believes that he is because there's a big problem. You need kashrut supervision. Who supervised? It must be the, co the, the, the cook was kosher. In the log, this is very interesting, He's in the, in the White Star Lines um, registry. His name is identified as Charles Kennel, the herb cook. The herb cook, H-E-R-B. Herb cook, well, anyone know what, I'm not a cook. Anyone know what an herb cook is? There's an herb cook, that's not a thing. So most theorize it was a typo. It's supposed to be, supposed to be H-E-B cook. Heb, Hebrew, he was the Jewish cook. I don't know. I think it's speculative to assume that he was Jewish. Moskowitz argues that he must have been Jewish. There must have been kosher supervision. I argue that's not true. It could have been someone else served as the mashkiach. The cook doesn't need to be Jewish for the food to be, to, to be kosher. You do need supervision. It doesn't need to be the cook, the, the cook. Number two, who said the standards were all that great? Maybe they had a kosher kitchen, but there wasn't necessarily a mashkiach. There wasn't necessarily real supervision. That's definitely a possibility. I don't know if research has been done into that. So I wonder if it's just speculative. At 1140 PM on April 14th, Frederick Fleet in the crow's nest, that's on the top of the boat. He spotted an iceberg immediately ahead of the Titanic and, Titanic and alert, alerted the bridge. First officer, William Murdoch, ordered the ship to be steered around the obstacle and the engines to be reversed, but it was too late. The starboard side of the Titanic struck the iceberg, creating a series of holes below the waterline. The, the hull was not punctured by the iceberg, but rather dented such that the hull stems seems buckled and separated. It soon became clear that the ship was doomed as she could not survive more than four compartments being flooded. Titanic began, began singing bow first, front first, with water spilling from compartment to compartment as her angle in the water became steeper. It was not a big fat zest, as they say in French. They tried, they had 34 seconds from the moment that they spotted this iceberg till they were able to, to till the moment of impact. Fatefully, the decision that was made was to rotate the boat to try to go around it. That was a terrible mistake. It was a terrible mistake, as we'll see, time permitting. Had it hit it head on, it probably would have survived. The fact that it tried to, and this was, a, this was for those who are in sailing, no maritime stuff, this was a terrible, it was, called, it was almost negligent, but they tried to maneuver around it. That was not the way to do, to, to, to approach it. And the, the iceberg hits, the, it, it rammed the side, it didn't ram it, it scraped along the side. And basically it was just like a 200 foot hole just pouring in with water. Boat had, no, had didn't stand a chance. Very early on, the captain, Captain Smith was the captain of the boat, who was uh, the best captain. He was the best captain that White Star Line had. He knew very quickly, it was very cool. He just measured the angles very quickly. You can tell what angle the boat is on. And he was able to tell very quickly, this thing is going down and it's going down in a hurry. 
Famously, we know the Titanic only had enough lifeboats to carry about half of the people on board. It had 16 regular lifeboats, four backup lifeboats. It was had fully, had the lifeboats been fully filled, you would have been able to, able to get about a, a little bit, maybe 1,100 people on, on it. There was, we said, over 2,200 people on the, on, the, on the Titanic. Had the Titanic been fully you know, filled to maximum occupancy, it could have held almost 3,300 people with lifeboats for only a third. Was that a scandal? No, that was in line with British shipping regulations. It was actually, they had, the way the British, I forget what it was called, the, the, the Board of Trade was the agency that oversaw this stuff, oversaw this stuff. Based on their regulations, the Titanic was had, had enough lifeboats on board. It didn't become apparent immediately that to, to the people on board, the net magnitude of the crisis. And that's why the lifeboats were initially lowered. One lifeboat, which had occupancy of over 60, potential of over 60, only had 12 people on board. The tradition of the day, interesting question, was women and children first. Now that depended, in the, if you were a man, if your potential to survive depended on which side of the boat you were on, port or starboard. If you, I forget which one. On port, the way the, the I believe it was port, was third officer Lightoller, who would be the, the um, highest ranking officer to survive the crash. His, he was in charge of getting people into the boat on the, on the port side. He had women and children only. On the starboard side, they allowed, if there was room, they would, they, men were, were allowed in. There was a tremendous discrepancy between if you were first class, second class, or in steerage, just because of the location of where the boats were. The boats were all on the top of the, of the Titanic. The steerage were all the way on the bottom, and it was a labyrinth and a maze to get to the top. There would later be inquiries, and people suggested that the people in the third class were not allowed to the lifeboats. Everyone dis dis uh, disputed that. That wasn't true. Rather, what happened was, is if you were in steerage, first of all, it took you forever to know where you to, to where to get to. By class, you were separated throughout the whole voyage. You weren't supposed to be in second class and first class areas. So it took a long time to realize we're in an emergency. It's time to go up into what was otherwise restricted areas. And number three, there was no one helping them. All of the staff, all the people running the, the Titanic were really up on top, helping the first class and the second class. With less than three hours after hitting the iceberg, the boat, the boat, um, the Titanic went under. Distress signals were sent by wireless technology, the, the Marconi devices, it was the early, early radio. Rockets uh, were, were shot up, distress the rockets, lamps, but none of the ships that responded were near enough to see, see the Titanic uh, before she sank. By 8.30 in the morning, this is all happening in the middle of the night. And now you're adrift on the on these lifeboats. The 712 is probably a little bit more than that, but people were dying in the lifeboats. And when, when people died, they were thrown over, you know, just to save room. Um, yeah, okay, so let's talk about that. If you were on the boat, you drowned. If you fell into the water, and this is where the movies are all wrong. If you were in the water, you were dead in about 20 minutes. The water was less than 32 degrees cold. How could that be? Salt water, and it's moving. You died of shock, hypothermia, cardiac arrest, half hour tops, but almost everyone who fell into the water basically died. So in any of the movies you've ever seen, they were swimming and this, you, you didn't make it, you didn't have a chance. The survivors eventually, they kept on rowing and eventually were picked up by a steamer called the Carpathia. This article, I want everyone to read, this is amazing. This article over here is on Wednesday, April 17th. And the first, the rest of the world, they found out very slowly, they had heard of potential of the Titanic sinking. The Carpathia was, it was kind of like, like a relay system. The Carpathia would wire to other boats who would then wire it and wire it and wire it. It was very hard to hear what was going on. It wasn't radio like you would talk. It was a, a, Mar a Marconi gram. It was basically using radio frequencies to send Morse code. Eventually, it was picked up in the United States from the radio of the Carpathia and the Olympic of exactly what had happened. The first person really for the next three days, the person who was really the, life, the source of information for the whole world of what was going on was a fellow named David Sarnoff a Jewish kid. 
who operated the, the wireless in New York City who was able to detect what was going on. He was the first person to report and he would be up for 72 hours straight because he was basically the lifeline of information to the survivors on board the, the Carpathia. Who survived the, the disaster? As you can imagine, it must have been un, unimaginable terror. In this book, they describe a horrible situation, a horrible story. Just, I don't want to, want to be too graphic. It's a story of one of the, one of the women in, in, uh, in steerage, a woman named Leah Axe. She was Jewish. She had her son, Frank, who was 10 months old. And as she was getting onto the boats, they were very insistent on women and children first, women and children first. So one of the crewmen saw that she was carrying her baby and invited her to get onto the boat. A man uh, tried getting into one of the boats and the crewman dragged him out of the lifeboat and told him that only women and children could enter the lifeboats. The man approached Leia and said, women and children first, I will show you women and children first, snatched baby Frank and threw him overboard. Talma tells us, terrible. Why does tragedy happen? Why does tragedy happen to this person and not to that person? Talma tells us the story, the story of King Hezekiah. He had a, a prophecy of sorts that his child that he was going to eventually have was going to be a villain. So he decided he wasn't going to get married. Decided he wasn't going to get married because he didn't want to have a child, you know, who's going to be a horrible person. Prophet Isaiah. Talmud tells us, approaches King Hezekiah, and he tells him, he chastises him, he says, Hadi kafi what are you doing looking into the hidden matters of God? As if to say, what God decides is none of our business. We're never going to understand God. We've got to live our lives and do our best. And him not getting married was inappropriate. Hadi kafi what are you doing trying to figure out the mysterious ways of God? We'll never understand why this person survived, why that person did not. Hadi kafi de Rahman alamalach. Of the 2,224 on board, only 710, 712 survived, less than 32%. Jews that died on board, Nathan Strauss, um, I'm sorry, Isidore Strauss and, and, and his wife, Ida, they died. Uh, Benjamin Guggenheim, Guggenheim died. At least of those 710 survivors, at least 35 of them were Jewish. The end of the story with King Hezekiah, it's a remarkable story and it's very uplifting. Isaiah tells Hezekiah, the fact that you didn't get married, you didn't, you know, it's a mitzvah to get married. You didn't try at least dating, getting married, you're gonna die. God has ordained that you're gonna die. And Hezekiah basically says, no, wait a minute, maybe it's not too late, I'll get married, I'll, I'll, I'll repent, I'll change. Isaiah tells Hezekiah, it's too late. No, nope, you're done. Hezekiah gets upset and he tells Isaiah, he says, he, he speaks to him very harshly. He says something like, something like, Shimino ben Amotz. He calls him like, not in a disparaging, disrespectful way, but he speaks to him very sternly. And he says, Kach mukublani mi base I have a tradition going back in my family, all the way back, Avi Abba, I'm assuming that means his, his grandfather is probably a reference to King David. And he says, Even if the sharp end of the blade is on your neck and you're faced with tragedy, don't give up praying to God. God wants you to survive. You'll survive. And even in the face of horror, if God wants, you can still survive. Never give up. It's a remarkable story, absolutely heart-rendering story. Just want to share. When Leia acts, she survived and makes it to the Carpathia. And while she was there, she imagined that she heard her son, Frank. She noticed that a baby was in the arms of a woman that she did not know. Leia became convinced that this baby was actually her own. Leia approached the woman and demanded that she return the baby to her. Both women began arguing and started a commotion. Crewmen rushed to the scene and were amazed to see the two women arguing 
over the baby. None of the crewmen who knew the rightful mother was. So they escorted both women to Captain Rostron, who was the hero of the, of the Carpathian. What's he gonna do? Does this sound like any kind of biblical stories? Captain Rostron found himself in the role of King Solomon and had to determine who the real mother was and who was not. Both women claimed that the, the, claimed the baby. Leia Axe said, I have a simple way of proving that the baby was mine. What would you do? Bingo. It was her baby. Frank survived. Frank was caught by someone in the boat, and it was her baby. Frank Ox lived till like in, into the 1960s or so. He lived in Virginia or something like that. Even we find ourselves in just horrible situations, you know, never give up from prayer. A lot of lessons to be learned from, from the Titanic. You know, if you ever think about, you ever hear about a plane crash, I guess the modern day equivalent to the Titanic sinking. I remember once reading that for a plane to, do you know how many safety features an airplane has? redundancies, backup systems, fail proof. When a plane crashed, what, here's what didn't happen. The pilot, you know, got mistaken. He turned the thing and the plane crashes. There are so, so many safety systems and backups. Basically, for a plane to crash nowadays, 10 things need to go wrong. If only nine things go wrong, the plane won't crash. You need a perfect storm. That was true in the Titanic. There were a million things that just went wrong. They, Titanic sent out multiple radio warnings that there was, they received multiple warnings that there were ice, that there was ice in the area. They had tested the water every probably half an hour at a minimum, maybe even every five to 10 minutes. They tested the water to see how cold it is, the way, way of determining is there ice in the area. And they knew it was really, really cold. It was a moonless night, as we discussed. And not only was it moonless, the water was very, very calm, which sounds good. It's actually really hard because you know how you detect if there's an iceberg in front of you? You see the ripples in the water from the movement of the water. But they said the water was eerily calm, which was good after the boat sank. People on the lifeboats had a chance. They didn't get washed over by the waves. But that's actually one of the reasons why they didn't see the iceberg is because it made no ripples in the water. There were no binoculars. In the crow's nest, that's the top that were, they were supposed to be looking for the, looking for icebergs. There were no binoculars. Why not? They forgot them. Back, back then, wireless communication was unregulated. The Marconi operator, those are the people that sent these wireless messages. They were independent. They were not part of the White Star Line, and they were not regulated. They were their own people. I mentioned that one of the, the biggest um, controversy over the Titanic, and it's amazing, if you read this article, it references, it's a mistake. It references a boat called the California. That's not what its name was, it was named the Californian. It's close, so we'll excuse it. The Californian is the greatest, um, most controversial element of the whole story. The Californian, according to what I believe and what most people will tell you, was within sight of the Titanic. The, the survivors said they saw the steamer off in the distance. It was late. At, it was middle of the night. It was moonless. But people said they thought they saw um, this boat. The Californian definitely saw. They, the Californian was in ice. They turned. They decided instead. Of what? Let me back up for a second. What What should have happened was Captain Smith should have turned. Potentially should have turned the boat off and said, "We're not going anywhere. We're going to lie, lie afloat, you know, and you know until the morning, so we could see where we're going." And that's what the Californian did. And they just went to, and the captain of the boat, Captain Stanley Lord, went to sleep. A little bit later, and oh, not only did he go to sleep, they turned off their wireless operator. He went to sleep too. People on board, crewmen on board the Californian, saw distress rockets being shot off about 10 miles away. They said the reports from crewmen sworn under oath that they saw eight rockets get shot up, which is what we built our understanding. That's how many the Titanic shot out. Three times, Captain Stanley, Stanley Lord was awoken and said, we see rockets in the distance. And he's like, uh, all right, I'm going to go back to sleep. Let me know if you hear anything. The radio operator was off. He didn't tell him, turn on the radio operator and see if you can hear what's going on. Tragic. 
Had they known what happened, by the way, they would have easily been able to get to the Titanic before it completely sank. And if not everyone would have been saved, a significant amount more passengers would have been saved. Um, and as we know, as we mentioned, there weren't enough lifeboat, lifeboats to even save a third of the passengers on a, full, on a totally filled boat. You know, it's an interesting thing. The Torah, we know, is filled with mitzvahs. We got so many mitzvahs in the Torah. And the Talmud, Masih al-Sasharim, famously quotes as an example. One of the mitzvahs, one of the commandments in the Torah, if you remember, is the mitzvah of the Nazir. It's not practiced today. But back during Talmud, during times of the temple, a person could take on a Nazir oath. A Nazir oath was a person who took on an oath, and you took, you were, you become a Nazir for 30, di 30 days. If you were a Nazir, you had many restrictions, certain things you couldn't do. You had to act in, you know, a tremendous amount of purity. And one of the restrictions of taking on a Nazir oath is you're not allowed to drink wine. Not allowed to drink wine. That's really what a Nazir oath is forbidden from doing, of the many things. The Torah itself says that a Nazir, not only can he not drink wine because he took this Nazir oath, he can't even eat a grape. And the Talmud says, this is an example. The Torah is teaching us a lesson. When you have a mitzvah, it's not okay to just say, I'm not going to transgress. But rather, what do you need to do? You need to make what's called the siag la Torah. We read in Pirkei Avot, Ethics of Our Fathers, the first Mishnah. The Anshei Knesset Hagadol, the men of the Great Assembly, they would say, you should make a siag la Torah. You should make a protective fence, regulation, rabbinic bans, what's called gezeros, to make sure that you don't transgress. It's actually one of the 613 mitzvahs. The Torah says directly, you, should, you have to listen to the, you know, again, we don't have it nowadays, but back in the times of the, of the temple, when there was an, an authorized basin, they were in, required to make enactments, protective measures. Biggest tragedy, and what would be very quickly learned in the hearings by Senator, Senator Smith immediately after the Titanic is that there were just, there were no regulations. No one on White Star Line wanted the Titanic to sink. No one in the White Star Line was acting recklessly. No one in the White Star Line, you know, wanted disaster. But we need to have more protective measures. And that's one of the lessons I think we see from the Titanic, which is very applicable to today. One of the people that was immediately villainized, even before he got back, was we rem remember we mentioned Bruce Ismay. Bruce Ismay was the CEO of White Star Line. And it was immediately theorized that Bruce Ismay, he was the one, he wanted to break the Lusitania record. And on that maiden voyage, he was in the bridge telling Captain Smith, no relation to the senator, it's confusing, the senator who was the one who ran the inquiry, he was pressuring Captain Smith, go as fast as you can. And when he was told, he himself received directly the telegram that there was ice in the area. He was the one who gave the order, full steam ahead. He told the captain what to do. It was Ismay. He was the villain. The CEO pressured the captain. Not only that, Ismay survived. Privilege. Women, what happened to women and children first? Of course, he's the CEO. Get out of the lifeboat. I'm the CEO. And he was villainized. I believe in the movie, from what I'm speaking to experts, he was made into a villain in the movie. From what I understand, anyone remember? He was made into a villain. One of the most important mitzvahs in the entire Torah that's applicable to every single one of us is the mitzvah of the prohibition against speaking Lashon Hara, gossip. Not allowed to speak negatively of one another. Not only that, there's a mitzvah, if you hear a negative report about someone, you need to judge, judge people favorably. And if you hear a report, you hear that someone did something that wasn't so appropriate, you're supposed to judge people favorably. Now, I'm not going to get into the technical details. How does that apply to someone who's not observant? Does it apply to a non-Jew? Different discussion. But the value, the message of having proper speech, of as Jews, are, we are, have a mandate, as people, we have a mandate not to try to harm people with our words, not to speak Lashon Hara, not to jump to conclusions. And we're not allowed to speak negatively about other people, even if it's true. And certainly, if we hear negative information about others, we should judge people favorably. 
Turns out Ismay was a hero. He, after in the Senate hearings that happened, he was totally exonerated. At no point, there's no evidence, no one said that he ever tell the captain what to do. It was totally the captain's prerogative. Of course he was on the boat, it's the maiden voyage. He wanted to see what the thing looked like. He wanted to kick a tire. He was actually one of the heroes getting people onto the lifeboats. He got in the absolute last lifeboat to leave the Titanic. As it was already being lowered off the divots, it was being lowered into the water. There was still a ton of room on the boat. There were nobody else in the area. So the guy said, we need an extra hand here to help. Can you jump in? And he jumped in. As the lifeboat was floundering in the water, he was the one rowing the whole time. He acted with honor. He acted with courage. His reputation was besmirched. He was regarded by everyone as the villain of the story, and it's just not true. One of the great tragedies, and we'll end in just a few minutes, one of the great tragedies, so we know there was a tremendous amount of loss, one of the, the real difficulties, if you're familiar in Jewish law, remember your Mish Mishnayis Kedushin, for those who studied Mishnah, if you're married, the way you get out of marriage, is a death of your husband or a proper divorce. Without that, you can't get remarried. It's bigamy. What happens, and this is a case, this is a situation that's discussed in the Talmud, if you have a woman, she's married, her husband goes on travel and never returns. What do you do? This is one of the most difficult situations in Judaism. This is called an aguna. Aguna means you're chained. You're chained to a dead marriage. You can't get remarried. You have no information about your husband. Maybe he ran away. Maybe he's in the town next door. Maybe he'll come home tomorrow. And it creates a really, really, really difficult situation. And the stakes are really devastating. If someone just disappears, he really can't get married. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Rabbi Katana. Many of you may know. He showed me he has. It's amazing. This, this was a common problem that people were aware of and still is. Not, now we have you know, better technology. We know it's easier to track people's whereabouts, but he has a letter, it's amazing. Mrs. Katanik, her grandfather who recently passed, they have a document. He fought in World War II and he had just gotten engaged when he was to be deployed and he was about to get married. And the people, in, they were in Scranton, Pennsylvania. There was Robert Katanik just peeked his head in. And in Scranton, Pennsylvania, everyone said, You're, they told his, you know, his wife's grandmother, you're crazy, you're going to get married. Let's say he gets captured. Let's say he doesn't come back. You're going to be chained to a dead marriage. And he wrote what's called a harsha. He wrote a document, which is a legally binding document that basically says, if you don't hear from me in, well, I don't remember the, I don't, I don't know the specific, this specific harsha, but the concept would be something like this. If you don't hear from me for four years, I hereby authorize anybody to give my wife a divorce, thereby ending the Aguna problem. But it's just a real, real, real problem. What happens if you have, I guess what we would call, I don't really have any evidence. We, we don't know if we know a person died and they went down in the boat. We see a person dead, his wife can get remarried. Let's say we don't know. We just have no idea. This actually happens. We are aware of 20 people on board that boat, 20 men who died, or how about this? 20 men who were not on that 710 people who survived. Can their wives get remarried? No one saw, if we see their corpse, if we see them drowning, that's one thing. Here, we didn't see anything. They just, they're not here. Where are they? Are they on the bottom of the Atlantic? Maybe, but that's, is that reliable enough? This is one of the most complex areas. And I mean, this is literally one of the most complex areas of Jewish law. Matter of fact, it's, it's almost eerie. Tama tells us, if you see a person fall into water, and you know, they're in a boat and they fall into water. Talmud makes a distinction, basically says, if you can see the surrounding, if it's like in a small lake and I can see everywhere around the lake and the guy didn't come up, that's good enough. So you can assume, you know, I didn't see him drown. You can assume he drowned. Where else was he? I know I would have seen him emerge, but let's say you don't see the end. Of, you, don't, you don't see the edge of the water. Maybe he's on the other side. You didn't see him. That's not good enough. This is an amazingly complicated area in halacha. Immediately after the Titanic, people raised what, what it was raised as a theoretical, what happens to these agunas? We do know of one woman who actually raised the aguna issue. Her name was Sivia Meisner. She was married to Shimon Meisner. 
He went down with, with we again, we know he went down with the boat, but was that enough information to say that she should, she could get remarried? The question was asked to Rabbi Jacob Reskin, who Rabbi Goldman, you'll appreciate it. He was a Talmud of Slabodka. He was a he was a student in the yeshiva, kind of the granddaddy of the yeshiva that we went to. And he forwarded this question to Rabbi Itzla Panovicher, who was a very significant rabbi. And I don't know the nitty gritty, but they, they said that she was based on the information. I assume it had to do with the fact if you have two reasons to suspect that someone died, that's usually the reason how we, we per, that that's usually what works. So here there's a reason to assume that he either drowned or he froze to death. If there are two reasons to assume that someone died, that's usually good enough. After the sinking of the Titanic, all the religious people and rabbis, priests, Indian chiefs, all made allusion. The Titanic, the connection, Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. Here you have mankind, builds technology. We're going to rely on our technology. What could go wrong? People drawing the, the comparisons between the Tower of Babel and the Titanic. So I'll do the same. Matter of fact, the, the Medrash tells us that when it came to building this tower in Bavel, it's a whole complicated story what happened there, but it was this tower represented the rebellion, people's rebellion against God. People were dead set at, you know, about building this, this tower to the point where people, they didn't care about human life. They just carry, they cared about their accomplishments. Talmud says when a brick would fall and break, they'd say, darn. We lost a brick. This brick could have helped us build this building. If a person slipped and fell and died, they're like, yeah, whatever. People are replaceable. <laughs> and to some degree, people, you know, the connection between the Titanic, like the luxury, the opulence, and yeah, what about all the safety? What about the care of human life? And the question is, have we learned anything? Technology, my dad of blessed memory was a scientist, loved technology. And he'd always teach me, technology from a Jewish perspective is neutral. You could do a lot of good with technology. You could do a lot of bad with technology. Take nuclear energy. You can power cities. You can destroy cities. You've got to be very, very careful with technology. You can't be negligent with technology because it could cause tremendous cat catastrophe. Have we have a, as a society learned from the Titanic? Have we valued humanity over technology? Look at the World Cup in Qatar right, or wherever it is right now. How many people would the, the horrible, humane, inhumane conditions to build those stadiums. Anyone read about that? It's terrible. But that's distant. What about in our own lives? Do we care about humanity more than, than technology? Are we careful about what we post on social media? I might not kill someone with a negative post, but we talked about Lashon Hara. Maybe I will really insult someone, ashamed someone, speak negatively about someone. You know, one of the lessons that we need to learn from the, the, the tragedy of the Titanic is, yes, technology is a wonderful thing. And it was a beautiful boat. Uh, Harlan and, and, uh, and Wolf, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, they're still in existence. They said it was the most beautiful ship they ever built. So it was the most beautiful boat they ever built. But the reality was they put technology over humanity. I guess the question that we need to think of is what about us? What about you and me? Are we being careful of the technological blessings that are in our lives? Are we using it to potentially hurt people? Or are we using it responsibly and making sure that we're safe with our technology? I want to thank you all for coming. Stick around if anyone has any questions. I really encourage you to check out this amazing, these amazing, amazing artifacts. And please help yourself to whatever food that's, uh, that's around. Thank you all for coming. I open up the floor to questions. If anyone wants to head out, please head out tomorrow.